Look, we're going to have millions and millions of unemployed, people really facing dire straits. And we're going to be having that for some period of time before things hopefully improve. And at the same time, there is this public awareness of this extraordinary wealth that was transferred to a few individuals. What's going to happen in this society when these people are without jobs, when their families hurt, when they lose their homes and so forth? At some point, there will be such political pressure that Congress will start getting into the act. There's going to be growing conflict between the classes. Mm -hmm. And if people are unemployed and really hurting, right. hell, there could be even riots. Well, that was in 2009, and joining us now from right, Washington. You saw what happened over the weekend in Rome. You see what's happening across the country. That was two years ago. And why, once again, what your father predicted has come to fruition. Former National Security Advisor for President Carter, Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski, over the weekend. And let me just say, Dr. Brzezinski, that pains me greatly to say that. I'm joking. You're always You're right. right. You're always right. Uh, my dad received the de Tocqueville Prize in Normandy over the weekend. Bravo. And wow. uh, part of his speech... Thank you. I, yeah. All right. Well, I, I, the reason I bring it up. No, the reason I'm sorry. The reason I bring it up is I want to read a part of your speech, which uh, you said this to your audience in Normandy uh, about America. Though a democracy, it's becoming a country of socially ominous extremes between the few super rich and the increasingly many who are deprived. In America today, the top 1% of the richest families own around 35% of the entire nation's wealth, while the bottom 90% own around 25%. It should be a source of perhaps even greater concern than the majority of all currently serving congressmen and senators, and similarly most of the top officials in the executive branch, fall in the category of the very rich, the so-called top 1%. Um, so you look at this problem and you have some prescriptions for the future, but they are uh, how we handle the rest of the world, what we can do to sort of shore this up. Dr. Sachs, I'll let you take the first question. Well, first, uh, beautifully put, and congratulations on, on that uh, wonderful, uh, richly deserved award. What do we do about it? Uh, how do we turn uh, the politics in this country, which is so much infused with big money, around because it does seem that money drives politics and it's not surprising that the rich come out on top. So I wonder what your thoughts are about uh, how we can change direction. Well, first of all, I'm intimidated by your presence because you know much more about this than I do. But let me just make a couple of points. First, I think we have to have a greater balance between what I call the financial economic universe and the political universe. We live in a, a time in which the financial economic universe is instantly global, very effective in passing th enormous amounts of money all over the world rapidly, doing it in a manner which is absolutely mysterious to most citizens and in a manner in which it benefits enormously and very often because purely of speculation and without any social benefit, just to the few. So we have this financial economic universe, which is the result of deregulation, globalization, and internatization, that is to say the instant flow of money, operating mysteriously. And you have a political universe, which seemingly is global, but is increasingly fragmented. There is no center of political direction, of political consensus even. The United States, which has been playing the preeminent global role, is increasingly powerless. It can't even assert its own interests in the Middle East, and it certainly is no longer dominant on the global economic scene. So you have this, this junction, and this disjunction at the same time takes place at a time when the public is increasingly aware of the fact that some people are getting incredibly rich largely on the basis of speculation that is so mysterious that even relatively educated people can understand it. Well, that is the source of this great frustration and of the beginnings of a global reaction against it. I think we're moving into a phase of serious social-political unrest worldwide. I, uh, I, I think you put it so rightly and so well. I, a uh, chairman of a board of one of the world's biggest companies said to me recently that, uh, he said, we're just bigger than, than any country. We actually don't care about uh, <coughs> local conditions. Uh, we don't care about local norms anymore. We can pay ourselves anything because uh, if people object, we don't really have a home base. 
It was kind of a, a stunning, stunningly clear way to put things. This is a company that works in more than 150 countries around the world. And he was explaining that they've basically become detached from, from their na national uh, home base. And I think that this really is something that every a country around the world feels. And the publics feel about it increasingly deeply because they feel vulnerable. They feel adversely affected by it. You know, I've been looking at this worldwide riots that are developing. They're all a reflection of deep passion, deep resentment, and fear. Now, the question is, where will this go? How can this be sort of concretized? And one thought that has occurred to me, and let me sort of mention it here casually without having really thought it through systematically, I think it would be increasingly helpful if there was a movement to publish worldwide lists of people who make, largely through speculation, enormous amounts of money almost instantly and basically hide the fact from their social contexts. You know, how many Americans are really fully aware of how many other good people, let's say like Warren Buffett and others, who really donate a lot of their earnings to charities, to philanthropy? But how many more are there in the hedge funds, in the banks, in a variety of other places who, on the basis of speculation, literally make millions of dollars that it would take a century or two for the average person ever to make? I would like to see those lists. And they shouldn't be that difficult to produce. And I think public pressure might have also some effect not only in terms of moving towards more systematic international coordination and regulation, but also to pressure some of those people to give some of it back, back to society. Big, I think it's a great idea. I wanted to ask you a, a question where you are the world's shrewdest observer of this. I, I was in about 20 countries over the summer, many international meetings, uh, summit meetings. I didn't see any sign at all of U.S. leadership. Wherever That's I right. was, whether it was in crises in Africa, whether it was in Asian business meetings, whether it was in Europe uh, over uh, European challenges, the U.S. seemed to be the incredibly disappearing power. I mean, uh, almost a, a collapse of presence even, not, not just of influence, but even of presence. Uh, I wonder whether you feel the same way, what, what you would make of that. Well, I feel the same way, and I would extend it from the sort of financial economic dimension also to geopolitics. Look at the last session of the UN. The United States, in effect, announced its abdication from leadership in the effort to produce some sort of Middle Eastern stability. We just gave up. We just gave up. Mm. And I don't think in many parts of the world there is much confidence left in American leadership. And this is seriously dangerous. This is tragic because it's avoidable. We're still the most powerful country in the world. But we're kind of not pointed in any clear direction, either geopolitically or financially, economically. I wonder if you were touching on this one. You said this in Normandy over the weekend. I'm going to read again from your speech. The despotism of ignorance, which de Tocqueville said, leaves the body alone and goes straight to the spirit, has the unfortunate effect of quite often diminishing the quality of political leadership in America. Again, he wrote, some vexing effects are evident in the American national character. Today, such despotism is manifested in the public's ignorance of the world around it, and in that public's reluctance to demand and accept short-term and fairly distributed social sacrifice in exchange for long-term renewal. That same ignorance, or more accurately, indifference, handicaps America's capacity to deal with the external world. How do we fix that, and is it leadership? That's absolutely, <laughs> I say correct because I believe it and I said it. Um, I think the only way we can fix it is by having a sense of direction historically, both in the financial economic dimension, recognition of the fact that the system is out of control, the independent autonomous financial economic system deregulated is completely out of control and heavily dominated by speculation, and by a realization that there are geopolitical problems that we have to deal in common, but in which America has to take the leadership, even if it is domestically not entirely popular. 
But that, unfortunately, in our society, really is dependent on public understanding of these issues. And there's very little public discussion of these issues. You know, the kind of debates we are having now in the presidential era involve slogans, simplistic assertions, Manichaean escapist views. You know, it's pitiful to be listening to the candidates for president discuss foreign affairs. They operate in slogans, uh, simplistic slogans. And since we're a democracy, a lot of that reflects basic public predisposition. Mm -hmm. And so the correction to this would be long and difficult. But nonetheless, I think we as a country have enough talent in it, have enough resources that hopefully over the next months and years we'll remobilize ourselves and assert some leadership of the kind that we did in the past decades. Mm, Willie. Dr. Brzezinski, it's Willie. Good to see you again this morning. Uh, you talked about Wall Street speculation. The approach from the White House and other politicians to deal with that problem seems to be merely to demonize Wall Street. I think it's important to point out your proposal for the list. There are lots of people on Wall Street doing very good things with their money. What can Washington do that actually tackles the problem besides creating a boogeyman and letting us all know that they're terrible people who don't give their money back. What can they do? We had this crisis in 2008 that shook the country, and we didn't get sweeping change out of that. If that didn't move us to change the system or to put rules in place to put some guardrails around Wall Street, what will? Well, I certainly don't think we should demonize Wall Street, and we should, as I said earlier, divide, let, make the public understand that there is a division between those who have a sense of responsibility and assume their measure of responsibility towards society voluntarily. And there is a movement among the very rich people to increase their donations and so forth. But unfortunately, there is an even larger number of people who massively enriched themselves over the last decade, incredibly so, to the degree that we now have this highly disproportionate social divisions between the rich and the poor. And I think they should be made known publicly. Public pressure, public condemnation, public shame can be very effective. But when it comes to the government, when it comes to Congress, I think Congress has to realize the fact that the financial economic system cannot operate autonomously and in secrecy in many cases, that we have to have disclosure, we have to have transparency, and we have to have control. So more control over the banks, more control over the hedge funds particularly, more control over earnings, more fair distribution of social responsibility through taxation and the elimination of loopholes, and pressure even on the rich to avoid flaunting their wealth the way some of them do. I see often people who have huge new yachts because that's become a symbol of wealth. And I'm struck how often these people who made all this money in America have on the back of the boat their registration, Cayman Islands, British West Indies, some obscure island in the Pacific. Now, doesn't that tell you something about their taxes and their financial arrangements? I think public disclosure by the mass media could go a long way towards a social awakening that's responsible and constructive in its effects and doesn't produce a stupid counterproductive witch hunt. Witch hunt. All right. Dr. Brzezinski, uh, thank you so much for being with us. Congratulations again on your award this weekend. And I, I, just, want to, I just want to say, I, this is the first time you've been on the show that I have ever seen you use an old Southern lawyer device. What? The false modesty. What? Saying that he was intimidated by Dr. <laughs> Sachs' presence. When well, we was. When we all know He's Dr. a good Brzezinski. economist. I'm uh, not. Dr. Brzezinski is intimidated <laughs> by nobody's presence. But I, 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 like, I, liked, I liked seeing you try that on for size, that, that rhetorical device. It, I'll do that next to you. Yes, <laughs> oh, you go. Lord. And then nobody will believe it. At least no. it's somewhat believable okay, with Dr. So Sachs. I can't wait till his book comes out. Oh, I, know. I can't wait till it your book so comes out. Out, Dad. Thanks for coming well, I'm on not the sure show. it's going to answer all of these questions. Yeah, it will. <laughs> I have a tries. feeling it'll do just fine. Thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you, Dr. Morning. Brzezinski. Coming Good up, to be we with have you. Susan and David Axelrod with us. Looking forward to that very much. A big event tonight. Oh, yeah. Uh, We're going. For, uh, We're going. For, for a very important cause. Morning show will be right back.